idea or even necessarily want to do it before I took action was life-changing for me. Now, I want to say it again. I want to make sure you get it. Let me say it a little differently. If you wait to feel like doing a thing before you do it, or to think it's a good idea, or to even want to, you won't do the will of God. You'll miss a lot of things that God is telling you to do. And our society today is very much feeling oriented. We bow down at the altar of emotions way too much. And we need to live on purpose, not emotionally or not off the top of my head. I hate it when I ask somebody a question, they say, well, off the top of my head, the last thing I want is something off the top of your head. <laughs> I don't even want anything off the top of my head. I want something that's deeper than that. You know, there's such a, it's kind of interesting the different things that I teach and the different things that people get excited about. You know, it's like we live in a world that's made everything pretty easy for us. I mean, really, you know, push buttons, get on escalators, go up elevators, machine that washes your dishes, another machine that does something else. I mean, really, compared to the way people had to live years and years and years ago, we have got it pretty easy. And the interesting thing is the easier we have it, the easier we want it. And it doesn't take very much at all now for us to feel that we are being oppressed and deprived. I mean, if the escalator's out, that is terrible. We, can you believe they did not fix this escalator yet? Now, what am I going to do? Well, walk some steps, I guess. Amen? How many of you agree that we just get kind of like, you know, we just want everything easy? And to be honest, Satan is using a lot of it to kill people's motivation and even to steal people's health. God gave you joints so you would move. I mean, look at all the things we can do. All kinds of stuff. I mean, your toes move, your knees move. You know, somebody says, well, my knees hurt. Well, maybe it's because you haven't exercised them for 10 years. I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to try to behave here. So... We, we have to get over thinking that everything should be easy for us. I'll tell you a phrase I would like to see you get out of your collection of phrases that you use. Let's get rid of this statement. It's just too hard. But, it, but it's just too hard. You know what? Nothing that God leads us to do is too hard. Come on. Nothing that God leads us to do is too hard. You can forgive people. You can forgive somebody who has treated you terrible. You may not want to, but you can. You may never feel like it, but you can. You may not think it makes any sense, but you can. And when we learn to start being careful about doing what God wants us to do, instead of thinking it's okay to just not do what he wants us to do, Hmm, you're going to have to get happier than that. <laughs> Woo! Be careful how you live. Ephesians 5, 14 through 17. Therefore, he says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead. <laughs> and Christ shall shine and make day dawn upon you and give you light. Look carefully then how you walk. Live purposefully and worthily and accurately, not as the unwise and the witless, but as wise, sensible, intelligent people. Making the very most of your time. Buying up each opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be vague and thoughtless and foolish, but understand and firmly grasp what the will of the Lord is. I said last night, what God wants us to do is use our free will that he has given us to choose his will. 
use our free will that he's given us to choose his will. He's not going to make us serve him. He's not going to make us believe. He's not going to make us do what's right. But he tells us what we should do, and then he wants us to do it willingly. And if we do, our lives will be so blessed that we won't hardly know what to do. How many things has God told you to do? And I'm not just talking to the people in this room today, but to people all over the world. How many things do you believe that God has put on your heart that you should do or not do, but you still have not obeyed him? <laughs> Honestly and truly, we should be able to say, as far as I know, there is nothing, there's no area in my life where I am purposely disobeying God. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, we don't make mistakes and get in the flesh. And I teach on love all the time. And a couple of days ago, I was just flat out rude to somebody. So I, I felt terrible about it. But it wasn't something I planned to do. It's not something I ever want to do again. That, that's, I guess, what I would call getting in the flesh. And boy, the minute that you do, you're sorry and you ask God to forgive you. That's just part of our, of our life. You know, we, don't, we are human beings and we're not going to behave perfectly all the time. But I can honestly say that I don't know of one area in my life where I am purposely being disobedient to God, foolishly thinking that I can do the wrong thing and have a right life. Well, you're too quiet for me. This may be better than I thought. See, it's foolish to think that we cannot do what God tells us to do and still have things work out right. But it's just too hard. <laughs> no, I can do all things through Christ, who is my strength. All things. So the first thing I want to talk about is being very careful about obeying God and realizing that God is probably not going to do nearly as much for you as you may be sitting around thinking that he will do, but he will do a lot through you. Amen. See, th that whole mentality, that easy mentality is, well, I'm going to pray and God's going to do it all for me. Well, God will do what you cannot do, but he won't do what you can do. And if we do what we can do, then God will always do what we cannot do. We are not spectators, we are participators. And I think Christianity in many instances has become a spectator sport. We gather in the buildings and we watch somebody on the platform. I wish I had your life. I wish I had your ministry. I didn't get it wishing. <laughs> God has an amazing plan for every one of your lives. And it, it, we, we're not all going to do the same thing. We don't all need to be up here. But God's got an amazing plan for your life. And you don't have to compare or compete with anybody. All you need to do is do the part that God is asking you to do. And no matter if it seems little to the world, you will get the same reward as somebody who's touching the whole earth with the gospel. Just do what God wants you to do and do it with all of your heart. God's given all of us abilities. Everybody can do something. And we either need to start using it or we're going to lose it. Let me just give you a couple of examples of the power of obedience. 1 Kings 5, 9 through 11. Now, there was a man named Naaman who was a leper. And uh, he came with his horses and chariots to the door of Elisha, who was a great prophet. And he wanted to be healed of his leprosy. And so he had an idea in his head of how this was going to work. And when it didn't work his way, he didn't like it. Elisha sent a message out to him. And, you know, Naaman was a great man. I mean, he was a, a well-respected man, a man that everybody, you know, bowed down to and catered to. And Elisha just sent a message out and said, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored and you will be clean. But Naaman got angry and went away sad 
and went away and said, Behold, I thought he would come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leper. So he just had this idea that he was going to pull up to the front door and, you know, the guy was just going to wave his hand over him and make everything right. I just wonder how many of us think we're just going to get up every day and God's just going to wave his hand over us and make everything right in our life. Anyway, I, <laughs> I mean, how many people... Oh. For a while, there was this thing going around in the church, and I think it's gone, thank God, but people were having debt cancellation services. Did anybody ever go to one of those? I, I don't know. I mean, like these people would come, and they were going to do these prayers, and your debt was going to be canceled, and I, I, that used to make me so stinking mad. You know, if you, if you spend 40 years getting in debt, living ridiculously, and now you think you're going to go to a service somewhere and spectate from the audience and somebody's going to wave their hand over you and make all your debt go away? It's almost criminal to tell people that they can have something like that. We sit around and want miracles and miracles and miracles, and God is a miracle-working God. But I'll tell you what, He wants to do stuff through you, not just for you. And you know, one of the reasons why there's a lot of unhappy Christians, and you know, really being an unhappy Christian is an oxymoron. We should be the happiest people on the face of the earth. You know why? You're not going to hell. Okay, the elevator's not working at the office. I gotta walk nine flights of stairs, but you're not going to hell, amen? <laughs> I mean, if we, put, if we kind of start to balance some things out, we can get a lot happier than what we are. But honestly and truly, I believe that a lot of Christians are unhappy because this idea has crept in and people get deceived. That, and, and we think because we go to church, we're doing our part. Well, I go to church. Well, woo. <laughs> well, I go to church every Sunday, you know. Well, what are you doing with what you learn? Amen? Are we a participator? I'll never forget a girl who told me this story, and I tell it every once in a while, so maybe you've heard it before, but, but she said, you know, I got to the point, Joyce, where I wasn't getting anything out of your messages anymore. And she said, I started praying for you because I thought maybe you had some sin in your life and you had lost your anointing. <laughs> yeah, tell me that. And... Uh, <laughs> now, how many times do people, they're not getting anything out of church anymore and they think it's the preacher's fault? So now they're going to go find another church where they can be fed. <laughs> Come on, I'm not being fed here anymore. I'm going to go. Whoo, Jesus. And there's times to move on and go somewhere else. You may not be getting spiritually fed, but chances are if you've been getting fed for a long time and now all of a sudden you're not being, getting fed anymore, maybe you're looking at it wrong. And so the Lord said to her, there's nothing wrong with Joyce. You're not getting anything out of her messages anymore because you are so full of the word that you have no place to put anything else. And until you start putting some of it out and doing something with what she told you to do, Well, she was getting unhappy because she wasn't doing anything. Can I tell you something? If you get active helping somebody else, you won't have any time to think about all the things you're unhappy about. I suppose I've got some problems I could get upset over today, but honestly, I haven't had time to think about them in a long time. I'm so busy trying to fix your problems, God will just have to take care of mine. I've had a stomach virus on and off for a couple weeks. I don't even have time to mess with that today. I just have to go on and do what I'm doing. Doesn't matter how my stomach feels, I gotta be here and preach to you. Amen. Amen? But we wanna sit home and nurse all of our stuff and come to church and spectate. Woo, Jesus. Well, see, Naaman didn't wanna participate. He wanted to spectate. He wanted the prophet to come out and go, 
But there's another man in John 9, verse 7, and I like what he did. And he said to him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and he came back seeing. Works every time. <laughs> Naaman didn't want to go do what he was told. He kept his leprosy. Now, eventually he did get around to doing it God's way. But the point is, is he almost missed his miracle because he didn't want to participate. Now this guy, blind man, came to be healed. He says, go wash in that river. He did, and he came back seeing I love it. John chapter 5, 6 through 8. My favorite guy in the Bible to preach on. I could put him into every message I do. Some of you already know what's coming. The man who laid by the gate at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years, waiting for a miracle. He wanted somebody to come and wave his hand over. <laughs> yeah. Some of you feel so bad you can't even hardly stand up. And you know what? If you just go get some exercise. Well, I don't feel like exercising. When Jesus noticed the man lying there helpless, <laughs> knowing that he'd already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you really want to get well? <laughs> Are you serious about getting well? And I love this. Here it is right here. The man said, I have nobody to put me into the water. <laughs> Come on, would you just wave your hand over me and make this go away? I have nobody to make this happen for me. And boy, you'd think that Jesus, as kind as he was, would have felt sorry for this guy, but it says Jesus said to him, get up, and there's a big exclamation mark. And maybe the best thing that I could say to somebody that's been laying in your bed for six months depressed and in a bad mood is just get up. Get up. Go clean the house. Go out and do something for somebody else. Go visit a nursing home. Cut your grass. Do anything but just lay there and be full of yourself. You say, well... You just don't know how I feel. Well, the truth is, I do know how you feel. And I almost ruined my whole life because of something that happened to me in my childhood that I was hanging on to and letting it poison my future. When God said to me, you can be pitiful or powerful, but you can't be both. Give up the self-pity and get on with life. Okay, now, it's time for you to take your life back. Does anybody agree with this? Yeah. All right. To be careful means to give watchful attention, and it means to supervise and to be responsible for. That's what it means to live carefully, look carefully how you walk. It means to supervise. Can I ask a question? Are you able to supervise yourself without an overseer? Or do you have to have somebody watching over you before you'll do what's right? There's a good example in Proverbs 6, 6 through 8. He says, go look at the ant. <laughs> go look at the ant. He gathers in harvest, having no chief or overseer, the Amplified Bible says. Having no chief or overseer, he still does what's right. Then when winter comes, he has everything that he needs. I want to pose a question today. What do you do when nobody's looking? That's who you really are. It's not what we do to impress people. It's not the way we behave on Sunday morning in church or even when we're around our Christian friends. How do we behave when nobody's looking? That's who we really are. That's character. Amen? Can we do what's right with no supervision? Can we do what's right because even if nobody else is watching, we always know that God Come on, I'm trying to help you today. 
And I know, you know, when you preach like this, your, your brain starts going crazy like all the things now you think you've got to change and give up. Now I can't do anything. God never tells us to do anything if it's not going to help us. God never tells us to do anything if it's not going to help us. Do you want to get well? <laughs> Are you serious about having the life that Jesus died to give you? You know what? I'm very interested in your salvation. We had 400 people last night give their life to the Lord. I love to see people get saved. But I'm not satisfied with that. I don't want to just see people have their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life and be miserable till Jesus comes back to get them. I want to teach people how to live in such a way that they can have what Jesus died to give them and so they can be a light that will draw other people to Christ. That's our goal. And boy, does life get exciting. It doesn't mean that it's always easy. It doesn't mean you always want to do everything that God asks you to do. But life gets good. Now, in an effort to help everybody that's watching by TV or radio or whatever, however you're doing it or you're here in the building today, let me ask you some very direct questions. I'll ask myself these questions too. What is your lifestyle and would Jesus approve of it? Does he approve of who you hang out with? Does he approve of your choice of entertainment? Does Jesus approve of the movies that you go to? Does he approve of the way you dress? Does he approve of what you talk about around the lunch table at lunch with your carnal friends? You say, man, I, wanted, I need to feel better. Can you preach something else? <laughs> no, because you know what? I could feed you dessert today. But that's not going to keep you healthy and strong. <laughs> Question number two. Do you have a specific purpose? Something that you believe that you are to accomplish in your life? Say, I'm getting a lot of the looks I thought I would get. <laughs> I don't know. I'm waiting for God to show me what he wants me to do. <laughs> you know what? Sometimes you're not going to figure out what God wants you to do until you get out there and start moving <laughs> and trying a few things. Well, what if I'm wrong? You'll survive. I've been wrong lots of times, and I'm still here. Amen? All right. Are you living your life on purpose each day, working toward the purpose you feel that God has for your life? And your purpose can change at different seasons in your life. Give yourself to what you're supposed to do in this season of your life. Bloom where you're planted and don't get so addicted to your plan that when God wants to change it, you won't let go of it and go do something else. Well, I want to encourage you to take an inventory of your life and then be honest with yourself. Is your lifestyle one that Jesus would approve of? Are you doing what's right even when no one is watching? You know, that's the true test of living a godly life. Today, I'm offering you my book, Seize the Day. And this is such a good book. I think it's really going to help you live the life that you really want to live. And we're offering it for your gift to the ministry of any amount. Now, if our television program has been a blessing to you, this is a double opportunity for you because everything you give today is going to go to help with the TV program to keep it on the air for you and also to get it into the into the lives of people who have never seen it before. So you give the best gift that you can today, and we're, that's going to help us. You're going to get the book, and we're going to get to keep going on TV. So let's just stay with me, because I've got something else to share with you in just a moment. God was calling me to do something big, but he had to 
make me an excellent person. I couldn't go off somewhere and somebody teach me to be excellent. He taught me by using the things in my everyday life. Let me ask you some very direct questions. I'll ask myself these questions too. What is your lifestyle and would Jesus approve of it? <laughs> Does he approve of who you hang out with? Does he approve of your choice of entertainment? Does Jesus approve of the movies that you go to? Does he approve of the way you dress? Does he approve of what you talk about around the lunch table at lunch with your carnal friends? He said, man, I, wanted, I need to feel better. Can you preach something else? <laughs> no, because you know what? I could feed you dessert today. But that's not going to keep you healthy and strong. Yeah. Question number two, do you have a specific purpose, something that you believe that you are to accomplish in your life? See, I'm getting a lot of the looks I thought I would get. <laughs> I don't know. I'm waiting for God to show me what he wants me to do. <laughs> you know what? Sometimes you're not going to figure out what God wants you to do until you get out there and start moving <laughs> and trying a few things. Well, what if I'm wrong? You'll survive. <laughs> I've been wrong lots of times and I'm still here. Amen? Amen. All right. Are you living your life on purpose each day, working toward the purpose you feel that God has for your life? And your purpose can change at different seasons in your life. One of my daughters homeschools her girls. And that's been her purpose, to be a good mom and to homeschool those girls. But now they're 13 years old, and God is changing her purpose, and she's going to start going out and doing some speaking because she really wants to help people. Give yourself to what you're supposed to do in this season of your life. Bloom where you're planted, and don't get so addicted to your plan that when God wants to change it, you won't let go of it and go do something else. And don't minimize whatever it is that God wants you to do right now. Don't minimize that. You may be taking care of elderly parents. Can I tell you something? I think that touches God's heart about as deep as you can touch it. Because let me tell you something, taking care of elderly parents can be a real job, I know. Because you know what, now listen to me, it's what we do behind the scenes that affects the power and the anointing that we carry out in public. Do you have a plan? Are you able to follow through with your plans? How many days do you have in which you don't accomplish what you set out to do? How easy do you lose your focus? <laughs> Are you leaving a legacy? Here's a good one. Will the world miss you when you're gone? What have you done with your life so far? You know, these are sobering questions. But we need to be sober sometimes. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be well balanced, sober of mind. Be vigilant and cautious at all times. For that enemy of yours, the devil, roams around like a lion, roaring in fierce hunger, seeking someone to seize upon and devour. And you know what? If we don't wake up, sleepy Christians, walk carefully, which means the Greek word is circumspectly, and that word means to walk looking all around you, being careful. It actually has a, a word picture connected to it of walking barefoot in a field of thorns. 
So how many of you would take your shoes off, go out into a field of thorns and just... <laughs> we wouldn't do that, but sometimes that's the way we live life. Amen? No, I mean, you'd be like, is this the right thing? Is this the right thing? Is this the right thing? I'm just asking today if we could start living a little more carefully. How many warnings do you ignore? You say, warnings? What do you mean? Well, let's just say that your back has hurt for five years, and you've never bothered to go see why. Well, when your body hurts somewhere consistently, it's warning you that something's wrong. And if you take care of little problems, they won't become big problems. Thank you for your excitement. All right, I'll just move on to something else. We had better seize the day before the devil seizes our day. 1 Corinthians 3.10 says, According to the grace of God bestowed on me like a skillful architect and a master builder. I laid the foundation and now another man is building upon it, but let each man be careful how he builds. There's the word again, careful or circumspectly. Paul is saying, I taught you about Christ. I've laid a foundation in your life. Now you're going to be building a life. Be careful how you build. And if you go actually study those scriptures out, it says that we can build with wood, hay, straw, stubble, gold, or silver. How are we building our life? I spent so many years going to bed at night regretting what I spent my day doing. And I don't want to do that anymore, and I don't want you to do it. I want to go to bed at night and be proud of what I got done that day. Yeah. Amen. What are you doing with what God has given you? A.W. Tozier said this, and I think this is awesome. A man by his sin may waste himself, which is to waste that which on earth is most like God. <laughs> you here on earth are more like God than anything else here. And he's saying, if you waste yourself, then you're wasting the thing that is the most like God. This is man's greatest tragedy and God's greatest grief. You know, waste of any kind is sad, and certainly the waste of an entire life is the saddest of all. And um, how many of you know somebody that has just wasted their whole life? Okay. Well, I think we all do. My dad did that, and... Uh, it's so sad to see somebody in their 80s on a walker, gray hair, all wrinkled up, who's pretty much alone and has nothing left but regrets. I will not live like that. I am not going to get to the end of my life and have nothing left but regrets. And the only way that you can not have regret tomorrow is to do what's right today. Today, we need to start making right choices. If God is dealing with you about anything in your life and you know that you need to be obedient to him and you're putting it off for another day, I think tomorrow's maybe the most dangerous word that we have in our English language. I'll do that tomorrow. I'll do that tomorrow. Well, what if Jesus comes today? <laughs> Thank you. It wasn't a loud clap, but nonetheless, it was a clap. <laughs> How many of you understand what I'm trying to do here today? <laughs> I'm trying to move somebody to make some decisions. I'm trying to move somebody to stop just waiting for somebody to come and wave their hand over you and make it all right. I'm yelling to somebody, get up! It's time to get up and start doing something with what God has given you. Well, I just don't know what God wants me to do. You know what? Half the time when I come up here, I don't have a clue what God wants me to do. And 
I've got a message, but I'll tell you one thing. I've never come up here and not had God work through me. And if you will take a step, God will work through you. Amen? I believe that God hates waste. I don't like to waste God's money. I don't like to waste my time. I don't, I don't want to waste my energy. Do you know that every day that you spend angry is a day that you have totally wasted? Totally wasted. Every day that you spend feeling sorry for yourself, it's a totally wasted day. It's completely unproductive. It does not help your future in any way, shape, or form. It just keeps you stuck in the same spot. Come on, we're talking about making some decisions today. You know, we're always spending something. <laughs> you're spending your time, you're spending your energy, you're spending your money. Now like today, you have spent, by the time you leave, you will have spent, well, two hours and 15 minutes from the time the service started, and some of you probably got here early, and so, Let's just say, let's just say even if you spent three hours here today. Okay, well, that's time well spent because you know why? This is going to help you tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. But you could have went out for coffee with two friends and sat and gossiped for three hours about everybody else you know. And that's not going to make you feel good. You'll be unhappy later today and won't even know why. <laughs> but now today, you're going to have a much better day because you're sitting there having life ministered to you. What does the Bible say? If you sow to the Spirit, you will reap from the Spirit life and life eternal. And if you sow to the flesh, you will reap death, ruin, decay, and destruction. Amen. Make good choices. Feel good about the choices that you're making. Amen? Amen. I figured out yesterday, and I'm down the road a ways with this, so don't, I'm not asking anybody to do what I'm doing, but I started working out with weights 11 years ago, and, uh, and I did that three hours a week. It would take me an hour three times a week, and I had a trainer. Well, about a year and a half ago, I started adding walking, and I got up to five miles every day. And so I spend about 17 hours a week exercising. Okay, now, I, and I'm not trying to impress you. I'm trying to make a point. Okay, because I, before I got up here to teach this, I took an inventory of my time. How much time do I spend watching TV? How much time do I spend sleeping? How much time do I spend doing this? How much time do I spend doing that? How much time do I spend with God? And I looked at it and I thought, okay, I'm spending 17 hours a week working out, but what am I doing with that? I'm buying years. See? I'm buying energy. I'm buying vibrancy. I'm buying the opportunity to be here a lot longer than I would be if I didn't do anything so I can help more people and maximize the gift that God has given me. And that's really the reason why I started doing it. I looked at myself one day, and I mean, God spoke to my heart, and he said, if you don't start getting exercise, you are not going to be strong for the last third of your journey. Amen? Amen? And you know, I mean, it is amazing the energy Dave and I have for our age. And Dave doesn't like to talk about old, but nonetheless, we got a few years on us. <laughs> Amen? I mean, that good-looking guy will be 76 in July. <laughs> and he's still got a six-pack. See, here's the thing to realize. You can add years to your life and not get old. I sure don't feel like I'm going to be 73 in 30 days. I don't feel like that. And when I'm out there walking and sweating and climbing those hills, I know I'm buying years. 
I'm buying energy. I need to be creative. I mean, I teach a lot of different things, a lot of different places and write all these books. I've got to be fresh and I've got to be creative. I don't have five messages that I can go all over the world and preach. Every time I get on the television, you want to hear something different. And my brain was kind of starting to not want to think anymore. Well, one of the reasons was because I wasn't getting any blood to it ever. <laughs> oh, you know what I'm saying. When you spend, when you spend your time, you're buying something with it. So do you want to invest your time or waste your time? And see, I don't think it's wrong to watch a movie on TV. I don't think it's wrong to rest. I don't think it's wrong to, wrong to go. I'm not saying that you got to just work, 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 work all the time. You need a balanced life. But we all know that we can sit and watch stuff on TV that is just flat out stupid. And just go. I mean, I've done that three hours. I mean, anybody else out there? And then tomorrow we want God to wave his hand over us. And Ooh, we're having too much fun for a Friday morning. I'm sorry for all the people that missed it. You know what I've been doing? It's been an interesting project. Several times a day now, I'm stopping and kind of going over what I've done with my time so far that day. And I'm finding it to be interesting because we often say life just goes by in a blur. Well, sometimes we need to take the time to think about what we're doing with the time that we have. Take the time to think about what you're doing with the time that you have. The only way that we can ever make any changes in our life is to take an honest look at it and say, what am I investing? What am I wasting? What would God have me change? You know, we're always adjusting and making changes in our lives. If you're never willing to change anything, life will never get any better. Remember what I said last night? You can't just keep doing the same thing over and over thinking you're going to get a better result. Let's maximize our life. Let's maximize our time. I like that word maximize, don't you? The devil wants to minimize us. But God wants to maximize us. That means to do the most you can with what you have, not the least that you can. Don't ever be the kind of person that just does barely enough to get by. Always go the extra mile. Let me tell you how that works. Get to work five minutes early, not five minutes late. Yeah, I thought I'd get a few giggles on that one. <laughs> Don't leave messes for somebody else to clean up. Let's get personal. If you use the last of the toilet paper, replace the roll. If you use the last Kleenex in the box, go replace the box. Don't just be glad you got the last one and then leave work for somebody else to do later on. Come on, you, you know, sometimes you think you shouldn't have to tell people this kind of stuff, but you do. You know, Paul told people how to dress. Sometimes I have to tell people how to dress. Some women just don't seem to get it. It's like, really? We don't want to see that. Go the extra mile. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go two. <laughs> well, why should I do that? You know what? To be excellent. God is an excellent God, and he has called us to be excellent, and that means that you always do what's right, especially when nobody's looking. See, this became, to me, a very precious principle early in my walk with God. 
I'd been born again for a long time, but in 1976, when God touched my life with the power of his spirit and called me to do what I'm doing now, I was not able to go off to Bible college somewhere. I didn't have any formal training to do what I'm doing. But God will let you go to the school of the Holy Ghost if you're willing to do that. And what that means is God can take every single thing in your life ordinary, everyday, mundane things, and he can teach you a powerful spiritual lesson right where you're at. And you hear me tell my funny little stories about putting your grocery cart back and doing different things like that, but you know what? Those things are precious to me because I was not an excellent person. I was not a person who always went the extra mile. And God was calling me to do something big, but he had to make me an excellent person. I couldn't go off somewhere and somebody teach me to be excellent. He taught me by using the things in my everyday life. I remember the first time the Lord said, don't leave that out there, put it back. <laughs> okay, now here's the thing, and I'm just gonna be honest with you, it took me two years. We're talking 1976, 1977. I was teaching a little home Bible study with 20 people in it, and I'd still be there if I wouldn't have learned how to put my grocery cart back. And see, a lot of people think, well, that's just silly. That has nothing to do with anything. It has everything to do with everything. It's what you do behind closed doors when nobody's looking that you do unto God just for him because you believe it's what he wanted you to do that makes you a great person. How to develop character in an image-driven age. Today, we care more about how many people we have on our Facebook account than getting prepared for eternity. It took me two years to obediently put that grocery cart back every time I went to the grocery store, whether it was cold, whether it was raining. And I could just hear the Holy Ghost, put it back. Put it back. Well, everybody else, you see, you're not everybody else. You're not everybody else. That's the problem. I don't care what everybody else does. We are not everybody else. We represent the Most High God. Amen? And I got all kinds of stories like that. I'm not going to get into them again. I'm sure that you've heard a lot of those stories. Do what's right, especially when nobody's looking. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that and that only. <laughs> you know, you can change some things in your life. Honestly and truly, every one of us can change some things in our life. You know, if you're frustrated all the time and feel like you're too busy all the time and like you're on overload and you're about to go over the edge and you're cranky with people all the time because you're so busy. <laughs> well, no sane person should be expected to do everything that I'm doing. How could you possibly expect me not to be frustrated with my life? <laughs> Sound like anybody you know? You know what, if you don't like your schedule, change it. I mean, really, who's making you do everything that you're doing? <laughs> come on, don't make me come out there. Who's making you do? <laughs> See, I say stuff like that and you're like. Change my schedule? <laughs> yeah, just try saying, no, I can't do that. No, I can't sign up for that. I'm already too busy. No, I won't be going. No, Junior, you're not going to play on another ball team. You're already playing on three, and I'm not going to spend my life driving you back and forth. <sighs> be an on-purpose person. We need to start taking our lives back and stop letting what's going on in the world rule us.
You don't have to answer the phone just because it rings. I'm still trying to teach myself that. Well, I want to encourage you to take an inventory of your life and then be honest with yourself. Is your lifestyle one that Jesus would approve of? Are you doing...